Uh, good morning to everybody. Welcome to this session on defending nature together, tackling growing threats against rights defenders. Uh, before maybe I start, I just want to mention that two of our speakers uh, unfortunately did not make it. One cannot travel because of existing threat, and one, there, he's from Latin America, and another speaker was not able to travel because she was denied visa. This situation already presents or sets what we're about to discuss now. We're going to, as part of the theme of the global landscapes, which is on rights to landscapes, we're putting a, a spotlight to the condition and situation of uh, environment and land rights defenders in the different parts of the world. Uh, I am very happy that we have a very impressive speakers who are going to talk of their direct experience and their communities. They're coming from three regions. We have speakers from Latin America and Asia and uh, from uh, Africa. Now, uh, just to make sure that everybody is with a headset, I just want again to mention that uh, the channels for, for the languages, one, number one is English, three Spanish, and two uh, French. The way this session will be done will be I will be uh, introducing first the speaker and then ask them a question. So it's, it's a moderated um, discussion, after which we will uh, open the floor for questions and, and comments. And then the speakers will then uh, conclude with their final remarks to end the, the session. Before we proceed, this, uh, this session is co-organized by the uh, Forest People's Program, the International Work Group on Indigenous Affairs, the Indigenous Peoples uh, Major Group, and the UN Environment Program. I am Joan Carlin, and I am with the Indigenous Peoples uh, Major Group. I'm also part of those that are uh, under threat for defending our lands, territories, and resources in the, in the Philippines. So uh, let me begin by introducing our first uh, speaker on this uh, uh, panel, M Mr. Hualdis Gonzalez Jimenez. He is a peasant leader and environmental defender of the Montes de Maria region in Colombia, uh, in the Caribbean. He was actually also held at the airport in Frankfurt uh, yesterday for four hours before he was finally made to come to, to Bonn. Uh, his, uh, his area is uh, strongly affected by the armed conflict and in which various mining and agro-industrial projects are being developed. Hivaldis, a native of the municipality of El Carmen de Bolivar, is the spokesperson for the displaced population, ethnic, and peasant organizations. He is a member of the Permanent Committee for the Right to Water and the Ethnic Peasant Commission for the follow-up of the collective reparation processes for communities that are victims of the armed conflict. He has been an outstanding leader of the marching community of the Montes de Maria that mobilized peacefully in 2018 to defend the water and territory of the peasant and ethnic communities, especially considering the conflicts related to irrigation districts that are the source of water for local communities and for the agro-industry of palm and pine, pine, pineapple and, and wood. So, uh, Uvaldis, what are the root causes of the violence, intimidation, and threats against community leaders and environmental defenders in the Montes de Maria region where you come from?
Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. It is a great pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for having me here. I'm coming from the region of Montes de Maria, Carmen de Bolivar. Before the Havana Agreement, we had a very big conflict in our region, Montes de Maria, and we started the peace process there in Montes de Maria in Colombia. One of the reasons why we have been persecuted, why there has been a lot of intimidation against community leaders is the use of land. Basically, that's the main reason. And also the use of the natural resources. Exerting control over the land is very important for them because they want to develop agro-industrial projects, for example. They have new ways, models of development. They also want to practice mining. And of course, that goes clearly against our traditional models, the peasants' models and the, of the ethnic communities. And after they impose the model in our region, they will have absolute power over the land. We won't have any kind of rights. We won't have any kind of restitution rights. That's a big problem from the agreements. And now we see that um, the laws are not taken into consideration. There is a very important law, 1428. But the biggest problems we have is the organization in the communities. We have uh, biggest problems because we don't have the capacity to organize ourselves. We cannot find leadership. And due to that, we, we've been oppressed constantly. We are a nuisance for the governments, for the people who exert power. And we are an obstacle in the development of these authoritarian politics. We are also an obstacle against these models of corruption, these um, projects which are horrible for our country. The biggest problem of our country is corruption, even bigger than violence. Why do I say that? Because corruption is the root of all problems. Corruption is the root of all horrible things we experience in our country. Corruption is also the source of uh, the misuse of public resources. Corruption is the real root of violence, intimidation, and oppression against the leaders, the leaders who fight for the rights of nature, for the rights of, of the environment. Up to now, we have experienced 566 killed leaders, and 68 of them come from the Caribbean region. And up to now, in this year, we have experienced 135 killings or murders of, murders of um, leaders. Maria Pides Durtado was killed yesterday in front of her nine-year-old boy. And that's a fight. That's a horrible fight. We have to experience every single day in our communities. because we have to face a lot of disequalities, a lot of injustice and corruption in our country, in our region. There are many laws in our country, but they are not implemented. All the agreements are not, implement, are not implemented in our country. 
the region of Montes de Maria has wonderful development plans. We decided no to mining, no to monocultivation, no to extraction or misuse of the land, because Montes de Maria is one of the richest places in Colombia and in the world. We, as peasants, we live there. Ethnic communities, black communities, we live there. And we want to protect our region. In the development plan, we say it explicitly, no to mining. But nowadays, in our region of Monte de Marias, we have more than 100 rights, uh, places where mining can be practiced when we're talking about land use, defense of water. Of course, we cannot allow any kind of mining activities because they are taking away our water due to these mining activities. This is a long-term strategy by the government, I think, in order to keep power in the elites. Basically, they don't care about anything. It is important that we act now. It's important that we don't reach this point of no return. Otherwise, we will lose our fight. It is important that we keep fighting for our land, for our environment, and for our nature. That's the basic reason why we are here, why we're talking about. Those are wonderful water reservoirs. Those water reservoirs are life. We have a documentary about, about the water, and we are talking about the grabbing of the water rights. There is not only grabbing of land, but also grabbing of water. Water has been privatized for the agro-industrial cultivation, and that's a very big thing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Hovaldis. That was really, uh, I don't know how, how to say when you said that it's a life, it's an everyday life of violence and, and threats to those who are fighting and defending their, their lands against the power and uh, all these uh, big development projects that are coming into your area. Um, we'll get back to you later uh, on, on this. Uh, now we move on to the next uh, speaker, Mr. Alba Rocio Rueda Para. Alba is a community leader from the collective territory of the Pediga and Mancilla in Colombia. Rocio has worked for the defense of life and territory, not only in the river basin covered by the collective territory, but also the neighboring basin of Kur Barado. He is a woman who stands out for being creative in her nonviolent resistance of her territory through poetry, song, and planting seeds. She has undertaken processes of organization with women for the internal strengthening of humanitarian zones and zones of biodiversity working to protect the life and diversity and conserving their territories in an integrate, in integral way. So, Alba, I'm really glad that we have a, a woman in the panel who is going also to present how women are, are leading and being creative in addressing the problems of indigenous peoples. So, Alba, what are the strategies and collective actions that you are taking to confront the threats to your territory? Good morning, everybody. I am from Colombia, from the department of Chocó. We work together with Curvarado, Hinguadando, Pedellita, and Mancilla. 
those are different municipalities in Colombia. The strategies of our work. First of all, we have created humanitarian zones in order to avoid that that the armed forces or private armies, they go there and kill peasants. We have also biodiversity regions because we think it is important to protect the natural resources that we have there, the very few that are left actually because the people and those um, big landholders, they have a lot of uh, interest of uh, keeping the land for them and that way that would um, abolish biodiversity. We also have uh, a school, a school Africo, so that the children of the communities are able to go to school. We have our own school there. We created that and also we, something I forgot, sorry. We have also the Peace University. We have founded the Peace University. It is located in the region of Cacarica in a protected zone, Nueva Esperanza, New Hope. It belongs to the municipality of Carmen del Darien. After school, children will be able to go to the Peace University. They will have the possibility to have a career and they will be able to defend the territory and the land. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alba. It's, it's important for also for us to know that people are not just sitting down in the face of violence and conflict. People are taking action. And women are in the forefront of these uh, actions. And, and thanks, Alba, for, for uh, telling us that your initiatives and, and efforts to even uh, involve the young people in this struggle. Uh, now, uh, we're moving to Asia uh, for the next uh, speaker. We have Father Anselmos Amo. He is a priest from Sacred Heart Missionary Congregation in Indonesia province between October 2009 to September 2012. Father Amos was a director of the Justice, Peace, Integrity of Creation of Sacred Heart Missionary Congregation in uh, Indonesia province in Jakarta. After completing his studies in social welfare in 2014, Father Amos has been and continues to work as a director of the Office for Justice and Peace of the Archdiocese in Merauke, West Papua. The main concern and issue his office is facing is indigenous people's rights to their lands and forests in Merauke, covering three districts in that region. So, um, Father Amos, in your view, what are the responsibilities of companies to address these sorts of threats and provide remedy for families and communities? What is the role of the Indonesian state in promoting projects in Merauke? Thank you. Meloke, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, this is my first time to speak in international level. Um, and um, I say uh, greetings from uh, my archdiocese, Archbishop, uh, Monsignor Nicolaus, to you all. And um, this is a large room, like Cathedral <laughs> of Merauke. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm a little bit... Uh, nervous here, but I think if I preach in the uh, Cathedral of Morocco, I'm not uh, nervous, but here a little bit, <laughs> because I speak Indonesian and now in English, but my English is not, um, not very good, but I, I will speak here. <laughs> so, in the Cathedral of Morocco, uh, 
uh, I began the Mass uh, by saying, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And the people said, Amen. But now, I will say, I started with, in the name of the development. And maybe you can say, Amen or not. Let us see. So, in the name of development, uh, the district government invites uh, investors to uh, invest the palm oil in the area of their government. Then the government, together with uh, police and military, guarding the businessmen to the fields in the remote area. Although they are daily tasked, they are rare, uh, even never going to remote fields with uh, muddy roads, uh, dirty cars, dirty feet, but money is not dirty, I think. But to take indigenous people and uh, they all came down. They say that companies will bring change. Companies will bring progress. Companies will bring prosperity. So they promise for clearing forests and to build the roads and bridges, building schools and community health center, send village children to the college level. The community will get a job in the company. They will build the church. They will build the community house and so on. That's the clear promise to people. But in fact, at the moment, indigenous people's land has been taken. The forest has been removed. Food, wild animals, you see this uh, uh, pictures. They say that uh, uh, do not uh, hunting the animals here because this is a wild animals here. But wild animals do not live in the palm oil plantation. They live in the forest, not in palm oil. Maybe uh, snakes or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah, wild animals, uh, natural medicine, natural medicine and uh, clean water sources are gone. Conflict between indigenous peoples. So we uh, work together with uh, people, with the government, for uh, mediate uh, conflict in uh, indigenous peoples. Conflict between them. And conflict between uh, indigenous peoples and uh, companies. And the fact that uh, the happiness is gone. If I look for them, this issue here is not only about the land and the forest of indigenous peoples taken in the name of the development and welfare, but the issue of concepts about development and welfare. The concept of welfare is emphasized from the quantitative side. For example, income of at least two dollars US per day. Or nutritious foods are several calories per day. School to college level. Accepted of for work measured from a diploma and the number of certificate of courses or, or training, and so on. Unconsciously, this concept appears in the company's promises when entering remote villages which are considered not yet prosperous. Therefore, land and forests must be taken for oil palm plantation so that indigenous peoples can prosper. However, this concept also has an, effort, an effect on increasing costs for humanity and environment. And indigenous people 
continue to cry until now and try to defend their land and forests for their welfare. Thank you. Thank you for that, Father Amos. I think that's the, uh, the your story about all these promises given to communities so that they will allow companies to take over their land. It's happening all over in different communities in, in the world. And, and, for, and thanks for highlighting the conflicting views on how do we actually regard development from whose perspective, from whose benefit, and, and from whose well-being is actually sacrificed. So we continue with Asia. Now we move to the biggest continent, one of the biggest continent in India. And India actually has around 100 million indigenous uh, peoples. I would like to introduce our speaker, uh, Mr. Gladson Dumdum. He is from Jharkhand, India. Gladson is an activist, researcher, and writer. He comes from the Kariya Adivasi community in Jharkhand, India. His family was displaced for an irrigation project built in Chinda River in Semdagat district in 1980. His parents were brutally killed in June 1990 while they were going to attend the Sindega court in a land-related dispute of a family in the village. Consequently, he has had to undergo through a long struggle for survival. However, he has accomplished a postgraduate diploma on human rights from the Indian Institute of Human Rights, New Delhi. Dong Dong is actually a very popular indigenous journalist in India. I'm, I'm really happy that he's able to join us in this session. So, Gladson, what are the current threats to the forest rights of Adivasi communities in India, and what is their response to these threats? Uh, thank you so much, and good, good morning, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for giving me such a great opportunity to interact with me. Uh, presently, there are uh, uh, several threats on indigenous peoples of India. First is uh, from uh, eviction from the forest. I think some of you must be knowing that Supreme Court of India uh, gave an order in, uh, this year in March uh, that uh, uh, people whose claim under the Forest Rights Act must be evicted from the forest. In between, because there was a general election, so government filed a petition in the Supreme Court on the basis of that, Supreme Court state its order. But then Supreme Court has given uh, order to the state governments of all 20 states, saying that you have to file the uh, affidavit that what you have done on this eviction. So the latest data is saying that 1.5 million claims under the Forest Rights Act has been rejected. That means nearly 7.5 million indigenous people will, will be evicted from the forest because on next 24th July, Supreme Court is going to hear this case. So that is the biggest threat. And then second is that government of India is also amending the Indian Forest Act 1927. And then three major amendment is going to happen. First is that now the state governments can declare any forest as a reserve forest. And once that forest is declared as a reserve forest, we will not be allowed to use that forest. And secondly, they are going to give absolute power to the forest guard. That means if forest guard sees any person in the forest with bow and arrows or with the axe, the forest guard can directly shoot anybody. This has been... Uh, give, given in the amendment. And third is that no legal action can be taken against the perpetrator. One has to ask the permission from the government. So if this amendment is done, there will be huge threat on the indigenous peoples of India. And then third one is that government is also going to build the wildlife corridor everywhere. 
in especially in my state the state of jharkhand there will be three corridor and three sub corridor and in this corridor 870 villages are coming and now they have already not noticed given notice they are asking us to vacate the villages so th this population would be 0.5 million again and fourth one is land bank government has constituted a land bank and they have already listed 2 million acres of land and they are going to give this land to the corporate and out of this land 1 million acre of land is a forest land and this land is supposed to be recognized under the forest right act and five fifth threat what i, I see is that government has brought a compa act compensatory forest afforestation act 2016 under this act those company who have you know uh, destroyed the forest they have uh, uh, given money to the government so that this money should be used for afforestation I, under this uh, act what is happening now the forest official they are fencing all the forest even the community forest in planting the commercial trees so the they are alienating the uh, people so all together if you calculate because 91% indigenous peoples we depend on forest and agriculture for our survival so the entire uh, this uh, activities will you know displace or alienate 90 million indigenous people from the forest this is the biggest threat but we are tackling we are trying first is that we are mobilizing people we have uh, resisting so you uh, must be reading uh, recently there was big uh, mobilization in chatisgarh and government was forced to stop the mining in the hill so that you want second we are also using our traditional gram sabhas village council those are legal bodies so we are writing gram sabhas are writing and sending uh, government opposing the mining and other projects but there are also fake gram sabha government is doing because they want to hand over uh, everything land territory and resources to the uh, corporates we are also doing uh, kind of political advocacy and using media social media solidarity with international national group uh, all these things are, are uh, we are doing we are trying our best and then last i would conclude by saying that why this happening it's happening because there is a big nexus between state and the corporate and recently the what election happened you must have read uh, new reports are coming that 600, 600 billion money has been spent in this election and one political party he is, who is ruling now has spent uh, 45% of this entire money so from where this money is coming obviously since corporate are in, uh, you know uh, uh, investing money during the indian election because they are their intention is to buy the entire natural resources we have so presently we are really under biggest thre threat thank you very much of course i will not repeat what uh, gladson has mentioned on this uh, alarming threat to the indigenous peoples in india and i hope we can come out with a strong solidarity for those that are facing these threats in in india the indigenous peoples so you've seen in the photo i've i've also been visiting india several times and it's it's really uh um, it's going to be a genocide if i may say if the, the plans of the government will be implemented like uh like what uh gladson has uh, mentioned we're now moving to africa um with uh our friend uh from the congo uh, basin uh, i from congo uh the rc i mean the republic uh of congo he is dl mujeri mwenge dl has more than 15 years of experience in indigenous and minority issues his areas of expertise are the rights of indigenous peoples on lands territories and resources including forest and biodiversity he is the focal point for the initiative program for development of pygmy one of the largest indigenous forest communities in central africa dl is a technical advisor for the national network of indigenous peoples of central africa region 
and a member of the board of directors of the CBD Alliance. So we know that in uh, DRC, in, the, in Congo, there's a lot of violence taking place around the imposition of national parks. So my question, DL, is how does violence affect indigenous leaders and communities in the Virunga and Kahusi Biega National Park? And what actions and strategies are, are they doing to protect their rights? DL, speaking in, in French. Merci beaucoup, Joan. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to speak French. And um, I hope you're going to be listening to me. And uh, I think we have interpretation. So I think you can understand what I'm going to say. A question has been raised. And it uh, is, uh, I was asked to share with you my experience and to talk about uh, the threats and challenges we're facing. It is about the indigenous communities on the one side that are being attacked, but also defenders of uh, indigenous rights are being attacked. Land tenure and government in the Democratic Republic of Congo is a big issue. In legislation, there is no mention, no reference uh, on the protection of the indigenous peoples. And for us, it is really the basis of the threats and challenges we're facing. Because there is no guarantee at all, no legal guarantee at all that protects those indigenous peoples and communities. And since uh, 1925, Park, uh, uh, the Virunga Park has been created. And in, in the 1970s and 75, national parks, so the national parks have been created. And the parks have been extended with a 600,000 hectares. And today, We have seen many aggression cases because we now live in areas that used to be our livelihood areas. More than one million people have been evicted in the park. So just imagine how those people are living nowadays. More than 600 people in the national parks of Kauzibiega Park today, more than 600 people are threats because they're threatened to be evicted out of those parks. And some people are also in prison today, the defenders of those peoples. Some people have been killed by the guards, by the national park guards, and today, there is a huge conflict in this area between the parks of those parks and the population. And so this is a huge conflict between the National Guards and the indigenous, indigenous peoples and communities. We have tried to raise a claim in the Court of uh, Human Rights and in Africa, but uh, now we're stagnating in Congo. And we told ourselves that we need to find other alternatives and solutions, and that we needed to establish a dialogue. And this is why we started uh, a dialogue with the government, because we want the government to find a solution for us, for our peoples. And this is also linked to, to the exploitation of natural resources. For example, when we look at the operators uh, of uh, the sites in uh, Kivarangu, for example, or in other national parks, uh, we can see that uh, people come from Kinshasa. And uh, we know that the governments uh, 
needs uh, money for the policies and for the projects. And so we can see that uh, things are happening. Thousands of uh, people that would use uh, to be in the crafts industry do not have uh, any means of uh, livelihood now. And today they have been evicted. And unfortunately, the free consent is not being applied, even though my country has uh, adhered to this process. We do not benefit from the positive uh, impact of those parts. There are revenues, um, for example, in ecotourism, but today we are not one of the beneficiaries of uh, this. And even mining exploitation does not have a positive impact on our communities. And we are also facing another challenges. We are being invicted. And so we really lose our expertise and our knowledge. And this is our identity. This is the basis of identity. This knowledge, this expertise is the basis of our indigenous communities. And we are losing this expertise. These are the challenges we are facing today. And we're trying to find a solution. And all this is linked to our livelihood, to our lands, because this is Mother Earth, and Mother Earth is the basis of our communities. This is I wanted to share with you, and thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you, Dl. I, I think with the five speakers so far, there are two sides of the coins that we see in terms of the re realities on the ground for indigenous peoples. One side is the imposition of development by state and corporations that are causing displacement uh, and loss of land and identity and dignity of indigenous peoples. On the other hand is also the conservation through national parks, which is again displacing communities and losing their knowledge, their dignity, their well-being. So that's the kind of world <laughs> that indigenous peoples are finding themselves in spite of the fact that they are the ones that are uh, doing sustainable landscape management. They are the ones that are protecting our resources. They are the ones that are uh, enhancing our biodiversity. So now we want to hear what the global community is doing. So we're, we're very privileged uh, to have here uh, the representative from the UN environment. I want to call on uh, our uh, the, um, Johannes uh, Rifich. Is that the way? Yeah, Rifich. Johannes leads the Secretariat for the Great Apes Survival Partnership based at UNEP, the UN, United Nations Environment Program headquarters in Nairobi. He is a member of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, Primate Specialist Group, and the IUCN Transboundary Conservation Specialist uh, Group. So, Johannes, what international bodies have a role and responsibility to address the issues we have been hearing on this panel? What should be, they be doing in response to these issues? Thanks for, is it on? Yeah, thanks for inviting me to the panel. You know, as you said, I have a slightly different background. I come more from the conservation world, and even I had a life before joining UNEP, so I did more frontline conservation in the um, African Great Ape Range states. And we did, unfortunately, have oh. experience in um, be, having been repressed by government authorities when mm. we raised unpopular points. <laughs> and you would think that in the 21st century, things would get better. Unfortunately, yeah. in many cases, they're not getting better. And many of you probably saw the Virunga film on Netflix, where um, a UK-based oil company hired South African mercenaries. Mm. And those mercenaries threatened communities and park authorities. Um, let me just frame the question a bit more and say that we often only think about that um, government officials hold environmental defenders, um, arrest them, sometimes torture them. Repression goes much further. 
And I was quite shocked to hear a few weeks ago when one of our partners called me up and said, well, now it even goes further that um, scientists who do environmental and social impact assessments and try to protect the rights of communities um, have been taken to court. But no national or international scientist can, can face a court case and basically can compensate companies when they um, <laughs> lose part of their um, profits. Mm. So it's um, becoming, it's getting yeah. even into a new dimension. So the, let me get back to the question. The question is what can the UN do and what can the international governments, um, international donor community do? Um, obviously human rights and human rights related to environment are at the core of the UN mandate. And um, let me um, explain a bit more what UNEP is doing because that's my own organization I'm which I'm working for. So UNEP enjoys a strong working relationship with the UN Special Procedures of the Human Rights Council. And in particular, UNEP has been working with the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment and the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights. So while we do not have a mandate to handle human and environmental rights complaints, um, yeah, in many in, emanating from defenders, but um, our partnership with the special procedures allows us to provide, provide, uh, to provide information and legal assistance. And let me clear, um, to be clear, we can do even more. We could uh, denounce attacks and torture, intimidation and murders of environmental defenders, and most often governments and elite industries don't want to hear this. <laughs> So I think that's important. I also want to, um, to mention that um, the UN Human Rights Council resolution um, titled Recognizing the Contribution of Environmental Human Rights Defenders to the Enjoyment of Human Rights, Environmental Protection and Sustainable Development recognizes the contribution of environmental human rights defenders um, to the enjoyment of those rights. Let me be a bit more specific. Um, UNEP launched um, a policy and uh, environmental rights initiative um, that was quite recent. And I think it's a, it's a nice example that this topic really becomes a bit more prominent in the, in the work we are doing. So actually through that um, um, environmental rights initiative, uh, UNEP tries to engage governments to strengthen inter, um, institutional capacity it tries to assist businesses to better understand what their environmental rights obligations are. And it also supports the dissemination of information on environmental rights to the public. There's a wealth of information linked to this event. Um, so if you are interested, you can download that information. Um, let me maybe stop here and see where the discussion goes to, but I'm very happy to, to provide more information on that specific nexus of of conservation and um, human uh, and human rights, and um, I, I must say we, we did have um, we actually established new protected areas in West Africa by following the best practice guidelines from IUCN and FPIC, and we were actually mentioned as a very good example that it's possible with the collaboration of local communities. Thank you. Um, thank you, Johannes. Uh, again, I'm happy that you mentioned the existing UN resolutions on the protection on, of land and human rights defenders, as well as the actions that UNEP is taking to protect uh, or at least uh, give attention to these uh, issues. So, and I, I think that's an important information for indigenous peoples to know because most often communities don't even know that these resolutions exist and that uh, a number of UN agencies can actually provide some, some support to their struggle. So now, after hearing from our speakers, we also want to hear from you. If you have any questions or brief comments to our speakers, I would like to open the floor for any brief comments or questions. Uh, as much as possible, we want to hear from, uh, from many. So I would like to request to make it brief and you can direct your question to any of our panel speakers or a general question. Uh, but I would like you to kindly introduce yourself first before making any comment or uh, questions. I see our special, is that Vicky? 
Yes, actually, I would like to acknowledge our special rapporteur. She's actually here, and she wants to get the floor briefly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joanne, and thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, I am Vicky Tauli Corpus, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And hearing all what you have presented really confirms a lot of the findings that I had in my report on conservation as well as my report on criminalization. So my question is, so in terms of redress, you know, of these uh, violations, what do you think, uh, I mean, what, what, what is the redress that you are uh, expecting or that you are, you know, uh, you are looking for so that these uh, issues can be addressed in the most effective way? I think it, the, the very tra the tragedy of this all is that it continues to happen and nothing much is achieved in terms of remedy and redress. So I would like to ask any of the panelists uh, what they think can be the most effective way of addressing the issues you talked about. Thank you. Okay, uh, I will get two more before we ask our speakers to respond. Two more questions. Anyone? I see here. Good morning. I'm Dil, Dil Raj Khanal from Nepal. I represent the local community, Community Forestry Users Nepal, which is called FECO Fund. Uh, uh, actually, <clears throat> as per my understanding, actually the violence against environmental defender, land grabbing, and, and expansion of protected area, uh, non-compliance of safeguard measures, all these are global problems, particularly for the indigenous people and local communities. Uh, in this situation, <clears throat> we think that the, our traditional campaign to protect our right, for example, organizing rallies, uh, using the public interest litigation methods or environmental impact assessment, all those tools and techniques for the advocacy are actually being very uh, uh, ineffective, particularly at national level. And there is lacking some sort of linkage between local campaign and international response. And, and the international safeguard measures are also being uh, some sort of uh, uh, very weak, particularly at national level, because resolution or declaration, all those things not be counted as a legal instrument, particularly when we go to the court, particularly at national level. Therefore, my question is that how we can link between local campaign, community campaign, campaign of the indigenous peoples, to the international response. There is some sort of gap between local campaign and international response. Therefore, yeah. we have to think about this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any, one more at the back? Bien, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Gregorio Mirabal. I'm the new president of the Coinca um, Amazonian Basin government. I would like to express my solidarity to the brothers and sisters that have talked before, because it's important that we fight for life, because life is under threat. There are many threats for life everywhere in our planet. But we, indigenous communities, are the ones who have to defend life of the planet, our life, I would like to call upon everybody to express solidarity for our work because we defend life in every single place in the world. Now it is the time to fight together, to develop a common strategy, to develop common actions at every level, at this level but also on the ground where everybody is living. A lot of strength and a lot of hope for everybody who's fighting for life. Thank you for, for that comment. We can still get one, uh, one uh, question before I pass it on to the panel. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Prem. I'm coming from Nepal. I'm forester by profession. At the age of 17, I joined Institute of Forestry and the very second day, my teacher explained me the same problem in 1988. 
the conflicts between indigenous people, local communities versus government about this land grabbing and all those problems. And after 30 years, at the moment I'm working in University of Hamburg, I am explaining the same problem to my students. That means in the last 30 years, we have not done so much progress uh, in this area. So my question to Ref is, particularly, does it mean that international communities are, are we failed to address the problem? Otherwise, what we are doing since 30 years, we have the same problem ongoing. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, I want this, the panelists to respond to some of the, question, the questions that raised. One is what's uh, the most effective way or ways to have redress to the problems that we are facing at the local level. And then the second one is how do we link local, national to, to global actions, especially in the using in existing international human rights uh, instruments. And uh, third is how do we evaluate international action is it, or do we think there's enough or that the, in, the international community is failing to address these issues so anyone okay uh, gladson first yeah uh, just i would like to uh, respond the question what uh, uh, vicky has asked especially in india what we are saying is that the state must enforce the law which we have and then constitutional provisions. If the state enforces the law, then the constitutional provisions, our land, territories, and resources will be protected. For example, like Forest Rights Act, what the act is saying? It's simply saying that anyone who is living in the forest, on the forest land or in the forest prior to 31st December 2005 must be given rights on the uh, on particular land or in the forest but this has not been enforced in fact many cases I, I can say for example in the state of uh, uh, Chhattisgarh community rights were given already given in the three forest areas when government found that there is coal mines and then the uh, 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 science and the, that coal mines to the Adani and then this three uh, uh, rights which were recognized were rejected. Similarly, in my state, 72 families, they had uh, filed for a claim under the Forest Rights Act, and then uh, second level committee has already recommended that this should be recognized, but then final body says, since there is a coal mines, we cannot them rights. And this is against of the law, because in the uh, law, section 45, clearly has been stated that no activity will be taken place uh, till the completion of rights, recognition of rights is done. So government is uh, uh, violating its laws. And then second, what we are demanding is that whatever law is made for us, we must be included. Who are you to decide about our future? Do you know that how we live in the forest? how we love the forest, how we are protecting the forest, without knowing anything, and also so-called uh, conservationists, they are lobbying in Delhi and other places with the ministers and then making the law. This is injustice. So a uh, second thing is that, and then third is we are saying, and we are demanding the government of India that uh, UN declaration on the rights of the indigenous peoples and also I, uh, uh, ILO Convention 169 must be enforce but they are not doing anything so these are the uh, uh, things uh, we are expecting if they do then our land territory and resources will be protected thank you uh, anyone from yeah uh, can you be brief please yeah eh, bueno. well I personally think that the work that is going on happens on rural spaces. And I think for us, the greatest retribution that we expect is that 
people from the big cities would also make this issue into their issues because this is not a matter of defending uh, the black communities, defending peasants and indigenous peoples. We're defending the world. We're defending each other and every single one of us. So what we're looking for actually is that the whole world can find a way to move forward and not go back on the environment. The environment right now is agonizing and we all have to pitch in to move forward because there are enough laws and norms, but they are not being taken into account. And that is why the people have to lead the initiative to defend our environment, our natural resources, our water, because we want this to become a reality, a priority for the entire world at any level. And this is why I think what we're looking for is that the world would come together. We want the cities, the rural communities, we want them to join forces as one. We want them to defend water, natural resources, the wildlife, flora. We, we want everyone to be pro-life. We want to defend life. Our leaders, community leaders, are putting their lives at risk to defend our world. So is it really necessary that we put our lives at risk to defend the world? Well, sometimes we have to, and I think we can do it. And it's We've had martyrs who deserve our respect, our appreciation, and I think as a world we deserve to give us a chance. Well, that was a very powerful statement. So, yes. Para mí, los internacionales no sean los que están fallando. Para mí es el gobierno que sale a las naciones fuera del país a decir de que allá está tranquila la situación y eso es mentira. Porque hay muchos líderes que han estado matando después de la de la Sorry. del acuerdo de La Habana. Sorry. Many leaders have been killed after So can you hear me now? So what I was saying is the government tells everyone who wants to hear it that everything in Colombia is okay, but that is a lie because there is war going on in Colombia. Many leaders have been killed and they were killed because they were demanding the rights that are owed to them, and that is absolutely unfair. And so I ask the UN and everybody in the international community to help us out. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we in uh, Indonesia, we um, try to uh, try to, with our indigenous people, try to clarify uh, indigenous land. And so they, after clarify with uh, their lands with participative mapping, and we uh, try to uh, go to government uh, for recognition by the law of, of uh, indigenous rights with their land and their forest and their, li their life. So, and this is our uh, effort for, for indigenous uh, people. And the second, uh, maybe uh, we failed to address the issue before because 30 years we have no uh, development in, in this issue. I think maybe uh, by the concept of uh, development and uh, and the welfare, uh, we have, uh, you must be, be a rich people or as a prosperous uh, people 
with uh, government uh, with the companies come and uh, and take your land maybe like that so, <laughs> so this is uh, my reflection thank you yeah. okay yeah. you want to respond to the question on international yeah. Yeah, let, let me maybe try to, to answer question one and three together. Um, it was mentioned before that we probably have enough policy but don't enforce it. Um, I'm not sure, but let me try to explain from my point of view because my, my background is in conservation and I feel that we still have huge gaps, especially in the countries I'm working. So let me give you two examples. In many of the um, range states where we are working, there's no... Um, legal obligation to do strategic, environmental, and social impact assessments. Often there's no land use planning policy in place. Governments take decisions, give out land for mining or other large-scale um, large development projects, and um, the maximum is they do is an environmental and social impact assessment, but you can't move the mine or you can't move the development. There's no real alternative, and I think um, there's a clear necessity that this enters national law. Um, a second point we have um, discovered in a number of countries, um, even when we push for community engagement and indigenous people's engagement, often there's not even a provision in national law. So the Republic of Congo, for example, is now discussing to replicate a little bit the law we have in the Dia Congo, that, they can, uh, that communities can manage their own land. So that's also a huge legal gap. Um, that doesn't solve all problems, but I think we, we need to look into um, these gaps. Let me um, finally say I also think that um, conservation theory and strategy has changed over the past 40 years. I mean, I'm part of the larger wildlife unit in UNEP and we have a bigger program on, we call it coexistence because we believe that human beings are part of that whole um, of nature. So coexistence of wildlife and, and people and at least for what is planned right now. Um, we follow proper standards, and I mentioned uh, a national park in Liberia, which was created in 2018 and followed best practice guidelines from IUCN and FPIC, so it's possible. What is a huge challenge, and I think my, um, my colleague from DRC mentioned that before, the historic injustice which happened um, to um, indigenous communities in Central Africa, and how to reverse this, this is a major um, challenge and um, we, we do know this, but I think we can definitely do better in the future and there are tools for it. Thank you. Thank you. Diel? The question of challenges is always a cycle of reflection. Because when we are there in the area concerned, we often don't know how we are going to face these threats. And we are always being blocked at the international level, even though there are declarations and standards at the governmental and international level. Their implementation needs goodwill. Now, at the local level, in order to avoid further victims and these rules, these rights, these laws need to be respected by all the governments involved in the conflict. This is a double challenge for us. So on the one hand, you have to address a particular government who is the author of certain actions. That's a problem. And then at the international level, there are mechanisms or instruments that exist, but uh, nobody can be put into prison um, because these uh, declarations are not or, or very often only recommendations. So nobody can be put in prison. It needs a lot of goodwill. 
It's always recommendations that are being um, formulated by international organizations, and very often they are not being implemented by the individual government. So that's the second challenge. But, but I would like to suggest, um, let's say, uh, official visits by representatives of international organizations visits to um, Democratic Republic of Congo could help us. So when the Special Rapporteur comes to um, Republic or Democratic Republic of Congo and speaks to our government's representatives to learn about the uh, situation and can speak about the existing mechanisms, that's maybe a way to convince the government. But it's a challenge still because we have been very active in this area for a long time, very militant, and we haven't always seen results. The question of the um, earth being threatened, we are seeing it, but the decision makers are very often not taken action. When it comes to cutting forests, everybody knows that we cannot live without the forests. Making forests disappear will lead to the disparition of us. We are l depending on the forest. We are dependent on, on hunting, for instance, and um, gathering things, fruit. So um, logging forests is a real danger to our identity. This is why it is important that our government does all what is necessary in order to make our rights be respected and to preserve our identities. Thank you very much. Thank you. We only have, unfortunately, we only have 10 minutes left, but I would like to ask if anyone from you has a burning question or a burning comment to say before I give back to our uh, speakers the, their conclusion. Yes. Uh, thanks, Joanne. Uh, my name is Sanjay. Uh, I'm from the Christiansen Fund. Uh, my question is to Gladson, but I, th uh, I, th I think it's, uh, it's a question that's larger to the panel itself. I think the Indian case is classic to the extent that, on the one hand, you have the Forest Rights Act, and the petitioners who challenged the Forest Rights Act were conservation uh, organizations. So it's you know Wildlife Trust of India, Conservation Society of India, and. It's interesting that it's the government that tried to defend the act, so the stay order that they've gotten from the Supreme Court uh, is, is from the Ministry of, uh, of Tribal Welfare is, 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 has sought that stay order. Uh, now, now what's, what's interesting, however, as, as you were talking about, is uh, while the government makes the argument in court saying that India is bound by the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, so you can't really kind of evict people like that, the very same government, on the other hand, is amending the, the Forest Act, uh, which allows for rights to be taken away uh, in the name of conservation and development. So I find this interesting, this contradiction that constantly plays out, where on the one hand, there is a way to uh, implement international obligations, but at the, uh, on the other hand, these very same obligations are violated through other acts or amendments to the act. So these contradictions are very interesting as at an international level, as these rights are more and more reinforced, indigenous people's rights, at the same time, contradictions develop within governments in terms of how to implement rights, while at the same time, how to kind of continue development as business as usual. So maybe to speak a little more to that. Okay. Anyone else? Last one. Run faster, Helen. <laughs> Oui, merci. On va aller très vite. Je... 
Thank you. I will hire up. My name is Phyllis Cam. I'm from Cameroon, and I'm a responsible uh, for a young people, a young people's project, a young Christians. And uh, there's also a religious person on the panel. I'm happy about that uh, to see the father there. When I've been following the different um, interventions, I haven't heard a lot about young people. The lady, I, I, I don't remember where from Colombia she's from. She was mentioning this um, Peace University and the school built for young people. And that brings to my mind the question to know whether young people, how are they included into this uh, fight? Young people are actually gaining the livelihood on the fields today. And it is a real problem for the government as well. So I would like to know that the panel may give us an example where young people are really engaged in this fight. Are they being taken account of? When it comes to the rights of the forest, uh, I think you need to have a lot of knowledge when it comes uh, and when you destroy the land for the young people, they will all go to the cities. They will leave the rural areas, and that's really another problem. So on the panel, is there anybody who has a specific proposal in this sense? question about the, how the young indigenous peoples are, are also involved. So we only have a few minutes left, so I would like to ask the panelists to quickly respond and also to give your concluding remarks uh, to, to those that were raised. Yes, so maybe we, we do like the yeah. Please uh, be brief because of the time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, About youth. In Colombia, we experience a lot of violence, as you know. And one of the biggest problems is what you were talking about. What is going on with the young people? They are going to the big cities. What are, do what are they doing in the big cities? One of the consequences of violence was that the people had to go to the big cities. And I have to say, there are no young peasants in our region. Young peasants, they don't want to stay in our region. They don't want to work in the field. So I think it is very important to develop a strategy to keep people in the region. People have to fall in love again with the, with the earth, with the land, and they should empower the territories. So we have to do a lot of work in our region, and many countries in the world, I think they do some work with young people. We have developed a small project, which is actually a big project. We are talking about peace workers, young people, peace workers in the region of Montes de Maria. Young leaders, they work in the post-conflict process. And in fact, we are working together with young people, and we think it is very important to work with young people. And the results have been very interesting. In our region, for example, we see that people are, are gaining again uh, this ownership on the land people are starting to work again in the in the labor in the work we do as peasants so we do a lot of work but it is important to do more we have there has to be a clear will by the government nevertheless we cannot experience a clear will by the government we are abandoned there we are alone in our fight but we will keep fighting because it is important with the support of god and everybody we will be able to develop our country and our region thank you
Thank you. In Africa, our community, we created that school because we think that it's important to support young people. They have organized many projects. I don't know what is the name of this project, but they develop a lot of actions, a lot of measures. They work in the school so that they can go to university, to the Peace University, and they want to develop themselves. They work, and we work together with them, but they develop their own initiatives. Thank you. Okay. Um, as a conclusion, I will say that the, in the name of the development and welfare, we are now losing the forest and land and the indigenous dignity. And we need much energy and uh, costs for restoring the humanity and the environment. And also including these uh, young people. Maybe we need to change this concept about uh, development and welfare. So indigenous people need uh, and have the rights with their forest and their land and do not uh, take, did not take for the company and uh, government. Thank you. Yeah, first, uh, I would uh, uh, request uh, uh, Vicky, the special rapporteur on indigenous people, to find a way to visit India that will uh, help us a great way. The secondly, uh, what you said, that uh, uh, I see that there is no such contradiction, because the present government has not done anything in favor of indigenous peoples. In fact, present government is amending all the laws, including land laws, forests, Act, et cetera, which are against, uh, which are in favor of us. And the H4H, uh, the intervention petition in Supreme Court is concerned. In fact, uh, uh, state government, uh, Indian government did not go to Supreme Court to defend us, but there was election, that's why uh, government went. And also in this argument, government said it is not the fault of the government, but it is fault of the indigenous people. They are illiterate, they, they don't understand, they don't understand the law. This is what argument uh, government did. So it is very clear this present government is a corporate sponsored government, so it will go any extent to uh, grab our land, territory, and resources. And final comment I would uh, like to say that whenever we are fighting to protect our land, territory, and resources, we are blamed or, blamed or coined as anti-nationals or people against of the development by the, not by only the government, but also by the so-called people of the mainstream. So I would like to tell them, and I keep telling everywhere, wherever I am going, that look, we are not the selfish people. We are not against of the development, but we are fighting to, uh, to protect our land, territory, and resources. This is not just our fight for ourselves, but we are also fighting for you. Everyone's future depends on our fight because the day we stop fighting the corporate and state, this nexus will grab all the land, territory, and resources, all the remaining resources, and everything will be over. So please, instead of blaming us, join us in our movement. Thank you very much. To Felix from Cameroon, I would like to say that you need to understand the level of uh, integration of young people as well. When it comes to the social organization of indigenous people, young people are considered to be part and parcel of society. They are not being treated um, in a separate way. And you know, what I am doing today, I, I was taught by people who were there before me. And it's the same theory um, we are sharing today 
with the young people. It's about a transfer of skills to the young people so that they will be able to do tomorrow what we are doing now. And the results we are striving for is, like the colleague has said, not only for ourselves, but for the future generations as well. So we need to empower the young people to obtain the results we are trying to obtain now. And, you know, I'm insisting always on the question of identity. The earth, um, land, and culture are elements we cannot separate. And, you know, we are defending our rights, rights that are linked to our identity because our identity is being threatened and we need to avoid that it is being um, completely eradicated. Thank you very much. So three quick um, final comments. Um, one is a response to the question about the inclusion of young people. Um, Grass published a mobile phone app on great apes, and I was very surprised when the teacher in Uganda called us and said, I'm using it for school. But through that tool, you can be connected to a real situation on the ground. Um, second comment, I personally think we can do much better in reconciling the interests of conservation and indigenous and local people, because at the end, we all want to, conserve, uh, to maintain a healthy a healthy ecosystem, but our challenge is the same. Once the forest has been deforested, it's not coming back. So I think we should join forces. And number three is basically, yeah, please take advantage of the environmental rights initiative and all the um, dissemination material you can download from the website. Thank you. Uh, we uh, we re reach our time, uh, but before uh, we conclude, I just want to make some uh, critical points that has emerged uh, from our speakers. One is that it's clear that the, we need to rethink the development paradigm that is now being imposed on indigenous peoples and all over the world that is actually causing not only a violation of our rights, but the destruction of the resources that everybody depends on and not just indigenous peoples and that the violations of the rights of indigenous peoples over their lands, territories, and resources is taking place with impunity, violence, corruption, and abuse of power are critical issues or at the core of, of what's happening in indigenous terri territories and challenging the, already the existence and well-being of indigenous peoples. And third, that while there are existing international human rights instruments that protect the rights of indigenous peoples, there are huge gaps in its implementation and, and that there is lack of uh, policy coherence at the, at the national level. There are conflicting laws, one hand on conservation and, and on the other hand development that are both negatively affecting indigenous uh, peoples. And there's also the lack of goodwill and political will by states to really protect the rights of indigenous peoples. Most often, they actually collaborate with corporations, and that is aggravating the situation of indigenous peoples in the way they are uh, doing their conservation and guardianship and stewardship of our natural resources. And finally, just to say, just to re-echo what has been said, that don't leave the defense of nature to indigenous peoples. It is the obligation of everyone. It is the duty of everyone to protect the only planet we depend on. So we need to come together to work together in the spirit of partnership, in the spirit of solidarity, and in undertaking collective action to change the realities on the ground for indigenous peoples. Let us all work together to uphold and affirm the dignity and well-being of indigenous peoples as the stewards of Mother Nature. Thank you, and let us give a round of applause to all our speakers.
uh, you can approach them for further discussion. Please feel free to approach our speakers if you have more questions or you just want to uh, express your solidarity to their struggles. Thank you. Thank you for joining this event. By the way, the session later on the voices from the landscapes, there's many indigenous young uh, representatives here who will be speaking there. It's just to make sure to, for everyone that there are indigenous young people that are also participating in this event. Thank you.